Well, good morning. We're uh, continuing this morning through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so we'll be in Matthew chapter 5 this morning if you want to open your Bibles. If you don't have one, we have some on the, under the seats in front of you and around you. Be sure to grab one, pass it down to a neighbor. If you're in Cambridge or Overland, uh, let somebody know and they would be happy to grab you and get you a Bible as well from the back. So this, this sermon that he's preaching, this Sermon on the Mount, is, is Jesus casting the vision of the kingdom of what the kingdom is to look like, what we are to look like as kingdom people, what it looks like for us to bring the kingdom to be and to full fruition wherever it is that we live. And we've called this series, What If Jesus Was Actually Serious? Because a lot of what he's, he's pointing out, what he's teaching, what he's casting as the vision is very countercultural to what we're used to. It's not um, the norm in our culture. He's, he's casting this sort of upside down, backwards, you know, drive on the left side, like we talked about, kind of vision, that if we truly are living this out, it will be contrary to our culture, and maybe, and probably even in different areas, contrary to our natural bends, our natural bends of life. And there are areas that will be challenging to us in one way or another that he's going to call us to change. And sometimes we, we ask him, as we're hearing these things, like, like are you serious? You, you really want me to, to do that? And that's a lot of what this series is about, is these questions, maybe this week or last week or the next week. And today our topic is our posture of giving, our posture of generosity, and how, how it is that we see giving in ourselves. Um, I'm sure all of us um, have seen a display of some kind, whether you've gone to a store and you've seen a product displayed, maybe you've gone to an art gallery and seen some art displayed for you to view, maybe um, a, a play or a movie or a, something like that, a concert where um, something is on display from the stage up front for you to see. Every, everything that is displayed has an audience, right? That's why it's displayed, because they want you to see it. They want you to, to view it. And most things, they have an intended audience, right? They've thought through who their audience is before they do it. And so there's this very intentional audience of, of who it is they're trying to reach. And maybe it's like in a consumer case in a store, they're thinking about who is most likely to buy this product or who am I trying to woo into buying this product? And that's who they have designed their display to reach. Other times, it's, it's like a concert or something where whoever is here, this is who our audience is, right? And it's not somebody who's back over there or over there or somebody who's not present. It's who's in these places and these positions as they're viewing whatever's happening. And so a display has the audience in mind. And today, we're going to see this word display used in our passage in reference to how we live our lives, both in terms of just how we live but also in terms of how we give, how we are generous with one another. And so the question that I think is burning at the heart of our passage this morning is, who is my audience? As I'm, as I'm living, as I'm going about my life, trying to be as faithful as I can be, who is my audience? Because as we see here in a second, he says our lives are on display, and we want to make sure our audience is the correct audience, okay? So let's, let's start here in our passage. Now, we've just crossed over into chapter 6 from chapter 5, but the chapter break is sort of inconvenient for us because the chapter break um, sort of divides verse 48 from chap of, verse of chapter 5 from verse 6, or chapter 6. I'm getting these all confused here, aren't I, this morning? It, it's dividing these, and so if we just start at the chapter break, we miss, I think, an important connection that Jesus is making. <clears throat> and so when we start in verse 48, we, we see that verses 48 and verse 1 are these bridges, if you will, that bridge from chapter 5 to chapter 6. And Jesus is keeping this similar theme but shifting his focus. Chapter 5, especially these last seven paragraphs that we spent the last few weeks looking at, are really focused on addressing the misteachings of the Pharisees, how they had taken the law and they had sort of twisted or changed it or adjusted it based on their own desires or their own cultural um, uh, application of it. And Jesus was saying, no, 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 I've come to fulfill the law and here's how it actually looks. Okay, here's what it actually means. And so he was correcting their misteachings. And now as we get into chapter 6, he's doing the same idea, but now he's, he's addressing their, their misrepresentation of the law, their hypocritical actions. 
Okay? He, we're going to see that each of these next few paragraphs, there's this connection to how the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, were living their lives, and how he's going to be pointing back and saying, here is how they're living, and here is how it misrepresents the kingdom and how we should be living. And so as we look at 48 and verse 1, we'll see this bridge happening that connects these ideas, but yet he's shifting the focus of it a bit. So we start with with verse 48. And we read this last week, so we're just reviewing this, this one, right? It says, so then, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, remember, we talked about the, this idea of perfect. I don't know what your translation says. Mine says perfect. <clears throat> perfect. It may be holy. It may be complete. It may be mature that's in yours. Um, it, no matter what your translation is, the idea is maturity, is this idea of growing in our maturity, growing in our completeness, growing in how we're living and how we're reflecting Christ. And I think it's important for us to understand that when we have faith in Christ, when we place our faith in him and we follow him with our lives, we become a disciple of Jesus. We are made perfect in that through him, we have a new identity and our identity is him and our identity is perfected in him. That doesn't mean we're now mistake free. It means that our identity has changed. And really, as we talk about maturity, as we talk about then this growth process through the rest of our lives, it's almost like this idea of getting comfortable in new skin, if you will, getting comfortable in new clothes, that I've, I've been made perfected in Christ, but I don't live like it because I'm used to not being perfected, right? And so I'm, I'm spending the rest of my life getting used to this new identity and how it fits. It's like a new shirt or something. It's a little stiff at first, and you're like, you know, I used to, I used to do these sins, whatever it was, and like now I'm trying to get out of that habit. I'm trying to, to find my new identity and what it looks like to live and embody this new identity, just like putting on new clothing, the clothing of Christ. And so that's this idea of verse 48 of continue on this path of growth and maturity. And, and you can tell, if you've been here the last few weeks, looking back at those seven um, paragraphs that we looked at, how each of those has kind of a growth process and how we understand it and how we live those out, right? And so now let's go to verse one and we'll see how this connects forward into where we're going here. And so now chapter six, verse one, it says, be careful not to display your righteousness merely to be seen by people. Okay, so we have in verse 48, we have perfection or completeness or maturity, whatever, whatever t uh, term you want to put there, right? Whatever your translation has. And now in verse one, we have righteousness, our righteousness. Now, righteousness, remember, is our right relationship with God. When we are righteous, we are in pr appropriate relationship with God, the Father. And so while these are two different things, our maturity and our right relationship, our righteousness, they are certainly connected, aren't they? That we cannot mature without this right relationship. And as we mature, the relationship grows as well. And so these two things work together. They, they come along with one another as we mature. As we understand one, the other grows. And as we under, grow one, the other one, we understand better. And so these work together. And so these two come together to talk about who we are, our faith, our maturity, how we are growing in our faithfulness and our understanding of our faith and who we are and who Christ is and what he has done for us. All this is working together. But verse 48 is casting this vision. It's pointing us forward and saying, as you grow, be holy as I am holy. Be perfect. Look forward. Keep growing. Keep maturing. Keep moving forward. And verse 1 is a warning of as this happens, a warning for us. And it's this warning of who our audience is. Not to display our maturity, our righteousness, to be seen by people. It's this, it's this question of as we are maturing, as we are growing... What is our view of ourselves in comparison to others? How do we view my relationship with others? And is my growth, is my maturity, is, is what God is doing in my life, is it something <clears throat> that I should brag about, that I should put on display for you to see? 
in a way that is prideful for me. Okay, and vice versa, right? It's this idea of who is our audience. He is warning us that our maturity, our righteousness, our perfection, our, our, our holiness, whatever you want to call it, whatever terms you want to put here, is not something for us to brag about. It is not something that we should be walking around proverbially saying, look at me, you see how holy I am? I just want to make sure you know, look how, look how cool I am. I am this holy. Do you see it? It's not that posture. Now, I say that, and none of us would ever actually do that, right? <clears throat> right? Now, we may not actually say those words, would we? Like, that, that's a little crass. But we, we do do this when we look down upon others because we're pretty certain we're better than they are. We do this when we, we cast judgment upon someone because they're not as mature as we are and they've made some mistake or they've done something foolish or that whatever it may be that we think, I, would, I wouldn't do that. We do it when we treat people different based on how we perceive their maturity, their faithfulness, their godliness, right? We treat them differently because they're... They're just, they're immature. So we, we couch it in different ways. When we won't stoop to somebody else's maturity level so that we can disciple them, we can help them, we can walk alongside them, we can help them grow. That's, that's, I, that's beneath me. I don't do that. It's these sort of thoughts or even things we might say that is this. That is us putting our maturity, whatever that may be, on display for the world to see. Not to mention the truly braggadocious ones that we all had that sort of awkward laughter that we don't do that, do we? But maybe we do. See, this isn't just an issue with you and me. It was a big issue in their culture in this time. Because the, the Pharisees, the, the heads of the Jewish religious system, they were known for how they followed the law, right? They were, they were the law followers to the letter, to the T, and they wanted to make sure that everybody knew that they did. And it was this idea where they're like, they're doing something and they're like, hey, do you, do you see what I'm doing? I'm following the law. You should too. Or, hey, do you see I'm, I'm not doing this one, and you shouldn't either because I'm following the law. You should be like me. And they held their, their abide, obedience to the law up <clears throat> as this display of their holiness to both gain favor, to gain credibility, to gain influence, to gain power, to gain reputation. Oh, man, Rabbi so-and-so. Ooh, man, he is so holy. I mean, he follows every law, not just most of them. And that, that was part of what their, their Levitic law system had set up, unintentionally, of course, but had set up was, was this prideful view of oneself that, that how well I kept the law versus how well you kept the law, it was this pride contest to see who, who holds the law better. And so even though there are no Pharisees that we are told at least present in his teaching, he is addressing very directly the way the Pharisees are behaving themselves. And I, and I picture that even, even though there may not be any present right there on the mountain in front of him, that he's, he knows these people are highly influenced by the Pharisees. That the Pharisees are the leaders, and even though the Pharisees have treated these people very poorly because they are the down and outers, they're the poorest of the poor of the community, they still see the Pharisees as religious leaders. They still see them as the kind of definition of maturity. They still are the leaders. There is still significant influence that they would have upon them. And I think, I think he is pointing that, hey, I know this is how you're being led, but this isn't the way of the kingdom. This isn't the way we should be living. And so this can be difficult. We, we hear this, 
And on one hand, we certainly don't want to be the Pharisees, right? They're showing off their faith for everyone to see on display. On the other hand, it may cause us to withdraw, to become so private with our faith that we don't want to be guilty of being a Pharisee, so we just totally like draw everything about our faith in so that nobody sees. And so that nobody will know whether I'm being faithful or not because I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't, I don't want to be guilty of like showing off my faith, so I'm just going to make sure you don't see any of it. And we fall into this trap that we've created in our culture where you don't talk about faith or politics, right? And we just insulate ourselves and our faith from the community around us. By the way, this was not at all what Jesus envisioned. And it was totally anti-cultural to what the Jewish community would have understood and believed in that day and time. And frankly, even in our day and time today, our American culture of independentness it's a word I made up, independentness of our faith is totally countercultural to how the, under, how the world understands religion as a whole. Very few cultures in our world would see their faith as a purely private matter. It's communal. It's intended, and as they understood it, to be a community of faith. And that we are to know one another's faith because we are part of the same community. We're part of the church family. We're, we're in this together. And so the question becomes, how are we one without the other? How are we a faith community without making my faithfulness a source of pride and, and braggadociousness, so to speak, for me and for you? How do we live together being faithful without being having the wrong audience and being on display for one another. And this is particularly interesting if you think back just to the last chapter we went through. In, in chapter 5, verse 13, we were told to be salt and light, meaning the world should know about our faith, and our faith should have an impact on the world around us. And with the light, it said, even said, like, would you take a light and hide it? No, you wouldn't. And so it's not that we are to take our light and hide it so that nobody sees it for fear that we're a Pharisee. It's understanding who the light is, that he is the light. He is the light that is shining through us. It's not me. Whatever transformation has happened in my life is not to credit for me. It's his. He is the one transforming me. He is the one transforming you. He is the one who gets the credit and the glory for you not being who you used to be. And when we understand that, who the light is, now we understand who the glory should go to. And when we you see here in verse 1 where he's talking about displaying our righteousness to be seen by people, the idea is that I am putting my holiness on display for my glory. That's not what he's saying. Our, our faith should impact the world around us. It absolutely should. This, this community should be different because we are here. We live in it. But we don't get the glory for that. He does. Because it's him working through us. And so, as we understand whose the light is and who gets the glory, we see our faith differently. He, we see who we are and how we're to be living differently. That, that yes, we are to be maturing. Yes, we are to be growing. We are to be a light in the world. But it's not for our glory. When the world sees our faith, when they see us, when we impact our world because of our faith, it's not for our glory, it's for his. And he finishes his, his thought here in verse 1, with the kind of the second half of the verse, where he says, be careful not to display your righteousness merely to be seen by people. Otherwise, meaning if you do this, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. Now, he's pretty clear. You have no reward. None. It's not less. It's none. See, see God is not impressed with your pride. He knows 
why you're maturing, how you're maturing. He knows the transformation of your heart. When you brag, he's not impressed with you taking credit for what he is doing. And therefore, you have no reward. He takes in verse 2 then, and he takes this this idea we've been talking about of, of our faith and our maturity and who is to receive the glory, who is to be the audience of this. And in verse 2, he applies it to a very specific situation. And he says, thus, whenever you do charitable giving, do not blow a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on streets so that people will praise them. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. Whenever you do charitable giving, charitable things, this is the term alms. That's a word we don't use much anymore, do we? When we give of alms, meaning we give either, in this case, financial, but we can give in different ways, right? When we give to those who need charitable giving, we're not to sound a trumpet. Now, maybe, maybe you've never done that, which is good, right? Maybe you're not a trumpet player, and you're like, well, Jeff, I've never played the trumpet. But what was happening, and there's actually, as I read commentators on this, there's some controversy on, on how regular of a practice this was in their culture. But it was the idea of a trumpet sound is an announcement, right? Like, if at any point in your life, you hear randomly from the distance, right? You know, like, something's happening. And, so, and you're looking around for the trumpet because something is about to be announced. They're drawing your attention to wherever the trumpet is, right? And the idea was that the Pharisees, whether a trumpet was actually sounding or not, the Pharisees were going, hey, over here, you see what I'm given? Do you see how much it is? Do you you see that I am doing it? Do-do-do, look over here. Do you see? I'm given. Aren't you proud of me? right? It was this idea of drawing the world's attention to what they were doing, to how they were giving, how much they were giving. Aren't I holy because I'm giving, right? They were putting their giving on display for the world to see. And it's interesting, he uses this term hypocrite. None of us like that word, do we? None of us want to be this, but the actual, like, the underside, the, the under meaning, so to speak, of hypocrite is actually kind of interesting for me. It's the same word that's the that word for an actor. It's this idea that you're playing a part uh, in something that you're not actually that. Okay, you're, you're playing a part, you're acting a part out. So you're a hypocrite. Now, we, we obviously take that in a very negative context, right? But like, like Matt Damon, he's a hypocrite because he's not really Jason Bourne. He's acting that out, right? Johnny Depp is really not Mr. Sparrow, whatever his first name was. All of you know, and I don't. Jack Sparrow, right? He's a hypocrite because he wasn't really Jack Sparrow. He was acting it. And what Jesus is saying by applying this term to the Pharisees is you act like you're holy and generous by drawing everyone's attention to this gift, but you're really not. All you're doing is acting. You're pretending to be something you're not. You're not really generous. You're not really holy. You're not really righteous. You're acting and drawing people's attention to what it is you're doing. You're sounding the trumpet to say, look at me, I'm generous, and really you're not. That is really uncomfortable. None of us want to be that. None of us want to be living our lives in such a way that we're hypocrites, meaning we're acting, doing things that are incongruent with who we really are. None of us want to be that person. Yet that's, that's what he's calling the Pharisees out on. So he's saying your, your holiness, your righteousness, your maturity, all these things, they are not for the world's display, for your glory, And thus, when you give, if you're giving for your glory, you're a hypocrite. 
You're giving for the wrong reasons. You're giving for your glory, not his. And for the second time, he says that God is not impressed with your acting. And then in verse 3, we get the word but. The but is, but is a contrast word, right? So in contrast to being a hypocrite, when you do your giving, do not let your, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your gift may be in secret. And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you. I want you to notice something, both here in verse 3, but also up above in verse 2. He says, whenever, whenever you give, up in verse 2 and here, but when you give. I think this is important. Jesus is assuming generosity. He's not saying we should be generous. He is assuming that we'll be generous. And this is really interesting when you think about who he is he's talking to. Remember who it is that's sitting there on the mountain with him? It's the poorest of the poor. It's the down and outers. It's the nobodies. It's the outcasts. It's the ones who are struggling day in and day out for their very survival. And he's assuming generosity about them. I think that's something we, we need to understand. The kingdom of God is generous. If we are to be kingdom people, we will be generous with one another. When we see need, assuming it's legitimate need, when we see need, we will be generous. And it may come in different ways, right? Here, they're talking a lot about financial generosity here, but in our, in our lives, we can give in lots of different ways, right? But he's assuming generosity. He's assuming that we will love one another, that we will be united as a community in such a way that we will be generous. Generosity is a kingdom principle. And as we talked about over the last seven paragraphs, the overarching theme of those seven paragraphs was love. How do we love one another well in each, in each of those situations? What does love look like? And so here, when we see one another in need, how do we love well? We're generous. We give. We help one another out. I love the, the pictures we see of this in Acts chapters 2 and chapter 4. And I encourage you to go look at those maybe later today. Just read those two, three chapters there. Because this is what the early church heard Jesus saying, how they were living this out. And it says that, they would pool their resources. They would sell their resources. They would give to one another freely so that nobody had need. It was extreme generosity. And again, we ask ourselves, is he serious? Yeah. He is assuming generosity. Now, I want to clarify something. We shouldn't be foolish with our generosity. We shouldn't be foolish. There's a difference between I think I need and I actually need. And we need to be wise in who we give to. But we also need to be loving and fair in who and how we give. See, in America, we have this assumption that it's built into our culture because we're a very independent, pull yourself up, bear bootstraps kind of culture. And we can sometimes have this assumption that if somebody is in need, they must be foolish. And I don't need to give to them because they should have figured this out without me. That's not loving, is it? That's not loving at all. Sometimes that is true. But to have that be an assumption built into our interactions with people is not okay. It's not loving. At the same time, we shouldn't just throw money at people or at organizations who aren't using it well, who are foolish in how they're using it, or maybe even evil in how they're using it. We should not just throw money at things because we're commanded to be generous, so here's a wad of money and just... Keep going, right? We should be wise, but we should be wise erring on the side of generosity because he's assuming generosity, pointing us to be people of generosity. And he uses this interesting statement. He says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing and how you give. 
Now, if you read your Bible too literally here, this is confusing because my hands don't naturally know anything. So what is he actually saying? He's saying that, that as we are being generous, we should be generous in such a way that the amount is not our primary concern. That what we give is such that we are just going with generous we, we're praying, we're saying, God, how can I be generous? And, and we're just being generous so that after the fact, I may not even know exactly what I gave, much less to be able to brag about it for my left hand or right hand to know, much less me to have you know what I gave, that I just gave. I saw a need, I prayed about it, I said, how can I be generous? How can I love them? How can I help in this situation? And I just gave. And it's not about the money. It's not about the amount. It's that I was generous. Now, the point isn't that nobody should ever know about our, our charitable giving, okay? People are always, somebody's always going to know. There's no way you can give and have it be completely anonymous to, to any organization or anybody. It's, it's very difficult. The point isn't that if somebody knows, suddenly I'm wrong. It's the point that my giving... The point of it isn't that somebody knows, that I'm just giving because it's needed, because it's the loving thing to do. And if somebody finds out it's okay, but I'm not doing it so that others find out, okay? It's just that my primary concern is that I'm loving people, that I'm being generous, and that I'm giving. Here's what I would say, though, is if you are tempted by the pride of this, if, if the pride of people knowing, hey, I gave this much or to this thing, if that is actually a temptation for you, something that you feel this draw to that you know you shouldn't, then maybe you should err on the side of just complete secrecy. Do it as secretly as you can possibly do it. But if that isn't a temptation for you, don't, don't get hung up on it. Give, give generously. And if somebody finds out, fine. Because it isn't about you, right? And they find out, you can point them to God and say, yeah, he is so awesome. that He gave me the ability to give that. It's about our generosity. See, it's all about our heart. It's about our dependence upon him. It's, this whole section is about knowing who our audience is, that as we grow, as we mature, as we live our faith, our, our faith will impact those around us, will impact the world we live in, but our primary audience is him. He is the one who receives the glory. And no matter what it is we're doing within our faith, within living out how God is compelling us to live our faith, but specifically in generosity, that we're doing so only for his glory only for his attention and only for his eyes. You know, I, I was thinking about the, uh, the story of the, the widow's might. It's in Mark chapter 12. And it's this interesting story where Jesus is in the synagogue with his disciples. And I'm just going to read it because it's just a few short verses. He says, when he sat down opposite of the offering box and watched the crowd putting coins into it, many rich people, rich people, we're throwing in large amounts. And you get this idea of throwing in and the clanging that it would have made, right? Like the rich person walks by and they're like, cling, 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 cling. And the next person, cling, 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 cling. And it's like they're making sure you hear, like, do you hear the clinging that I'm throwing in? It says, and a poor widow came and put, placed two small coins worth less than a penny. So it's the idea that she wasn't drawing attention to herself. She placed them there. And he called his disciples. And I picture like maybe they were in the synagogue, but not all together. And I picture him like, hey, guys, come here. And he pulls them in close. And he said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the offering box than all the others. For they gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty and put in what she had to live on everything she had. See, it wasn't about who knew. It was about their heart. 
They may have been throwing in more coins and making more clanging, but it wasn't generous. Whereas the widow, what she put in, may have been a small amount, but it was generous for her, for her budget, for her life. It was generous, and nobody knew it. Who is our audience? Who is the audience of our faith? Who is the audience of our generosity? We are to be dependent upon him. We are to be humble and generous at the same time. And that can be hard for us, because let's be honest, if, if we give sacrificially, it's painful, right? And it's nice when others know the pain but we're to be humble and generous. And when we do that, we change the world. We change people around us, people we love, people we know. We change their worlds. Our light shines, but for his glory, not for ours. And so our, our challenge today is to be humble and generous. Would you pray with me, please? Father, um, it is you, it is you who is working, who is acting, who is transforming our lives. We know as your, as your disciples that it is, it is not us who are changing ourselves. If we could do that, we would, but we know we can't. It's, it's you it's you living in and through us. It's your Holy Spirit transforming our lives. And Father, that, that alone is just amazing to consider. But Father, I pray that as we experience that in our lives, as, as we come to greater understanding of that, that we would not be prideful. That it would actually humble us. That very fact, that alone, would humble us as we understand who we have been and who we are. And, and we give slight consideration and dreaming of what you may want to do, that we would be totally humbled by your work. And Father, I pray, I pray that we would be generous people, that we would understand that whatever it is we have, it's actually yours, not ours. And that, that you, you want us to be generous. That you, you have called us to love one another. And, and that sometimes that's going to require us to give, even sacrificially, give generously. And Father, I pray that when we do that, the, the humility of our faith would cause us to give humbly. And so, Father, I know that it, this is one of those things that maybe goes against our, our character, or against our bent. Please transform us in this way. And I pray that whatever we as a community, as a church, give to one another, to different kingdom projects in our community, to this church, wherever it is we give, that we would, we would be excited to see how you're going to use that to change the world, to bring your kingdom into greater and greater fruition here on earth. So, Father, I pray all of this in Jesus' name.